Um, so this session is when correlation is causation. It'll be sort of a little bit statistical, but without the math, so don't worry about that. Um, I'm Stan de Brouwer. I do analytics at sort of various different media companies. I think uh, um, some of the last ones I've been at is The Guardian and Fusion. Um, I also uh, am trained as a statistician, so that's kind of my background. Um, yeah. If you think about the difference between correlation and causation, or if you think about how do we, as people, how do we actually know that one thing causes the other? Well, the straight answer is we actually cannot. It's like nobody can see causation in nature. And it's actually interesting to think about how kids, when they're very young, at, at about eight or nine months old, uh, how a baby first learns about causation. And it's very interesting, they do these psychological um, uh, experiments, and if you show a, a kid, a baby that's about six months old, if you show them that one ball hits the other, sort of, you know, on a, on a billiard table, and then nothing happens, both balls just come to a stop, uh, to us that would be very weird, right? You would expect the other ball to start rolling, you know, because you know, they hit each other and that causes the other ball to start rolling. A six month old kid doesn't care. But a kid that's about nine months old, they will be really surprised and they will sort of, you will see by their eyes and, and how they react that they can already see that there's something wrong because time and time again, sort of through their short lives, they've already seen that if one thing hits the other. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, okay, okay. that's fine. Um, that if um, one thing touches the other, the other thing will start moving. That's sort of a, a, a regularity that you've seen. It's one thing occurs and then the other thing occurs. And after a while you start thinking like, well, you know, it's pretty obvious that one thing is actually causing the other. But so this is the only way, uh, the only possibility that we have to detect causality, regularities. So correlation is causation in a very real sense. Um, before we continue, I guess a, a quick uh, a practical um, uh, message. Originally, I think on your notes, this was introduced as a workshop, but as you can see, we are not really in a room where you can do a workshop. You know, there's no really tables for, for group discussions and stuff like that. So unfortunately, it will be just me talking. Um, but, uh, and, and so the, work, um, the talk will take about 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and then if you had anticipated this taking an hour and a half, that means you now have a half an hour coffee break. So that's nice. Um, but to continue with, uh, with the story, uh, one illustration I really like is, um, some of you may have read the book Thinking Fast and Slow by uh, Daniel Kahneman. He's a psychologist. He tells this story of how he used to teach at Princeton, but he used to live in New York. And so every weekend he would, uh, uh, with his wife, he would go from Princeton to New York to, um, you know, just to go home. And uh, one time when he was driving back at a on a certain stretch of road, what he saw was a, a burning car by uh, the side of the road. You know, nothing special, I guess. It's, you know, it happens every once in a while, unfortunately. Um, all right, so he didn't, he didn't think that much of it. But then the next week, at almost that same stretch of road, another car was burning. And that suddenly got his attention, like what, what, what is happening here? You know, again, he didn't really uh, sort of look into it. Uh, you know, it's just something that happens. It's just a weird coincidence. But now the interesting part of the story, what he mentioned was that for the next two or three years, whenever he would drive by that stretch of road, he would expect there, almost expect there subconsciously to be another burning car. There never was, of course, because it was just a fluke, just a statistical coincidence to see two burning cars one week, next week. Uh, but for two, three years afterwards, he was kind of expecting that to be there, which just goes to show how, how quickly we are at sometimes inferring regularities and patterns, even when they're really not there. Um, I think the, the main message of this talk is that 
the idea that correlation is not causation. It's true. It's definitely true. You know, a lot of correlations exist that are not causes, but it's trivial. It doesn't really mean anything. It's sort of like, how would you feel if, if you went to the doctor, you were feeling ill, and your doctor told you, before looking at you, you know, you just walk into the door and your doctor tells you, you may or may not be ill. And then, all right, this will be 50 euros and, and now, you know, this is the end of the consultation. You would be upset, you would be weirded out because this is not what a doctor is supposed to do. A doctor is supposed to investigate and see, like, you know, what is going on here? Is this person ill? Are they not ill? What kind of illness do they have? And that's kind of the same thing with statistics or with journalism or with any kind of discipline where you're trying to infer uh, sort of what is going on in reality. You shouldn't just be happy with saying like, you know, uh, correlations are not causes. No, either they are, and then you sort of say like, well, this correlation is a cause because of these five reasons, or this correlation is spurious. It's not a cause at all because of these five or ten reasons. Um, but of course that's kind of easier said than done, right? It's, uh, it's easy for me to say like, well, you need to have your reasons, but then how do you even start thinking about that? Uh, and, and so that's what we're going to discuss. And we're going to discuss it sort of in the, in the negative sense, not how does, correlate, how does a correlation translate into causation, but the other way around. When is a correlation not a causation? And whenever one of those errors are not present, um, you'll be able to sort of say, well, you know, we're pretty sure that, that a cause is what is happening here. But just before we do that, um, I think part of what I hate so much about the phrase correlation is not causation is also that it sort of started to mean the opposite of what it's intended to mean, right? So often do you read, correlation is not causation, but, and then people make a causal statement. So that's the exact opposite of sort of what the statement is supposed to mean. I don't know if you can read that in the back, but it's, this is a quick Google search that I did and I just found some of these quotes sort of very quickly. Correlation is not causation, but here is more evidence rejecting the view that world globalization means wider gaps, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, that's a causal statement and you just said that a correlation does not imply a causal statement. You know, correlation is not causation, but the plunge began just as the SEC voted in favor of, that's a causal statement. Correlation doesn't imply causation, but these statistics suggest, ah, those are the worst, right? They say these statistics suggest, but really what they want you to think is that one thing causes the other. And suggestions and correlations is just sort of the lingo we use to sort of weasel ourselves out of situations where people ask, like, what, what is your proof? And it's like, no, I just suggested it. Um, oh, this is the last one. Of course, correlation is not causation, but these studies at the very least suggest, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's, these, this stuff upsets me a lot. Um, but if correlation is not causation, then what is it? So that's sort of what I was getting at, like when, um, what is getting in between a correlation and a cause? What sort of, if you have a correlation, if two, and so a correlation is when two things occur together uh, uh, consistently, when does that not imply a cause? And there's actually sort of five main types of uh, sort of saboteurs, as it were, five types of error that can stand in between those things. First thing is random error. And that's just sort of something we've noticed and it's sort of what we saw in the story by Kahneman. It's just sort of a random fluke. Two things can happen together um, for a certain period of time, but it, you know, that might just be happenstance, it might just be a coincidence. And random error is one reason why a correlation might not be a cause. Um, confounding is another case. And it's when you think that one thing causes the other, but really there's a third thing that causes both what you think is the cause and the effect. We'll talk more about that later, of course. Selection bias is when, for example, your sample is not representative. You have sort of a, a selection and that causes bias. Measurement error is that often what we want to measure are not things we can actually measure. For example, if you think about the 
uh, if you want to measure the wealth of a person. How are you going to measure the wealth of a person? Um, you might look at their income, but some people don't have any income and still they're very rich because they have uh, you know, tons of stock uh, and, and whatnot because they have 20 houses in, uh, in Italy and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many ways in which you can be wealthy, but that doesn't translate into income. And so measurement error is always a problem. Judgment error is sort of for, I, I think some of you were here from my talk yesterday, something we talked about yesterday as well. Measurement error, uh, sorry, judgment error is when you have perhaps the right answer to something, but you're asking the wrong question. You're not interpreting your statistics right. Um, so this is still very vague, but now we're going to go into these five, type, five types of error individually, sort of in, in way more detail. I will start with random error. And random error is actually what gets most of the attention in all of these discussions about correlations and spurious correlations and how correlation is not causation. But actually, random error is the most boring of the five types of error because random error is the kind of error that statistics was invented to get rid of. Statistics as a discipline exists to get rid of random error or to be able to deal with it in any case. So you've probably seen sort of charts like these. This is um, TylerVegan.com. If, uh, if you're following me on Twitter, I, I put a, a link on it uh, to, uh, to this website. Uh, they, they have all of these kinds of correlations. So the number of people who drown by falling into a pool correlates with films that, the amount of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in. A correlation of 66%, that's, that's pretty good, right? For uh, the statistically minded, you can see that the p-value, which is a, an indication of the, the evidence that there is, and the lower, the more evidence, the p-value is above 0 0.05. So, as, uh, so a scientist would already sort of say like, well, you know, I don't know if I trust this, but still, I mean, look at this. It's, it, it looks pretty convincing, right? Um, one thing that I, I see right now is, is kind of unfortunate is you can't actually see the y-axis because what you, what you would see if you saw the y-axis is that actually it's, it's sort of been um, uh, trimmed so that the y-axis doesn't go to zero and if it would actually go to zero then you would notice that actually both lines are almost flat, right? So that's sort of a first problem. But the bigger problem is that if you actually look at, and so Tyler Vegan is the person who creates all of these sort of spurious correlation uh, charts, and he has a methodology behind it. The way he does it is he starts by sort of collecting, for example, a hundred different time series. A time series is just a, a series of points over time, just sort of almost randomly. So, you know, if we look at the previous slide, he collects people who drown by falling into a pool. That might be one of the time series that he collects. And he collects them almost randomly. And then he just looks for the ones that have correlations. You know, you can sort of almost automate this. And now think about the weight of the evidence. If you have a hundred time series, a correlation is always between, between a pair of those time series, right? Between two of them. A hundred time series, that translate into 4,950 potential pairs. You can pair them up differently that way. You know, those are all the possible combinations. If we look back to the previous slide, how, like if nothing were really going on, if Nicolas Cage was not causing people to drown, um, how likely do you think it would be to see something like this? I don't know, it's hard to say, right? But I would say like, that would be like a one in a hundred kind of thing, perhaps, you know, that seems fair. So one to 99 odds, well, you know, if you, apply some statistics to this, and for the statistics nerd, what you would do is you would apply the inverse survival function of the binomial distribution to this. And then what you get is that there's a 99% chance of actually finding 34 of these correlations like we just saw amongst those 4,950 potential correlations. So it's almost a given that you're going to find something like this. It's, it's, it's almost a given. Just a, a brief, and, and so because of this, random error is generally, statisticians think random error is boring because we, we know how to deal with it. 
because if you know that there's a 99% chance of finding at least 34 of these correlations, then you know you suddenly realize that the weight of the evidence in favor of Nicolas Cage being a mind control person who can cause people to drown um, is not very likely, right? Um, a brief aside before we move on, a spurious correlation is actually a technical term in statistics as well. And uh, what it means is that if you have a correlation between two things, this is the only math in, in, the, in all of the uh, talk, by the way. Uh, if you have two things that have the same denominator, so C in this case, they will always be correlated. It's a, an interesting fact that is something you wouldn't think of, but so if you have one thing that is something per capita, cheese consumption per capita, and then you have another thing like drownings per capita, those will always be correlated. That's just sort of a side effect of the fact that they have the same denominator. And this is the original meaning um, of a spurious correlation, something that we've known of since I think 1904 or something is when Carl Pearson uh, came up with this term. Uh, it's a little history lesson. Um, there is, however, one reason to be scared of random error, especially for those of you here who do science journalism. Because one thing that we've noticed in the uh, past 20, 30 years is that to get something published in a scientific journal, what you need is evidence. You need evidence in favor of whatever it is you think you found. And so if you haven't found evidence of a certain type of scientific phenomenon or whatnot, then you're not gonna publish it. You're just gonna put your result in a file drawer. So you did an experiment, you compared two groups against each other. One group, you shouted at them, and the other group, you just talked at them. And then you wanna know, is one group at the end more upset than the other? And maybe they're not, maybe they're like, why is this weird person shouting at me? I don't really care. Uh, and so you don't find any significant difference between those two groups. Are you gonna publish that in a scientific journal? Well, no, most journals won't even accept that uh, because it's, it's no result at all. Uh, but so you're, you're just not gonna put in uh, the effort. But what that leads to is there are so many scientists these days and they all kind of investigate similar things. Sometimes they investigate exactly the same thing. So you might have, for example, um, 10, 20, 30 different teams investigating the effect of the same drug or of the same uh, anything really on a certain type of cancer. All right. But if we think back to random error, and random error can sometimes cause flukes, right? It can sometimes cause things to look as if one is causing the other, even if they have nothing to do with each other whatsoever. And so if you have these 20 teams, the first team might fail. The second team might fail to find something. The third team might fail to find something. But maybe, you know, the 20th or the 30th team might say like, oh, we have found that Nutella chocolate is a cure of cancer, just because of random error. And so the scientific file drawer is, um, is a big problem. It's uh, some of my favorite uh, uh, sort of scientific studies that are uh, caused by this file drawer problem. Uh, three of my favorites. The first is extrasensory perception. This got published in one of the, uh, the uh, most prestigious uh, psychological journals that exist. Uh, extrasensory perception, so Daryl Bem found out that people can actually, um, yeah, sort of read each other's minds. Of course, before him, probably 20, 30, 40, 100 scientists tried to find extrasensory perception and didn't. But if you have a small enough sample and you keep trying, you will just find something. The second is Amy Cuddy, who came up with research into a power pose. I have to be honest, I don't even really know what power pose means, but I've been told it's something like, you know, before you go into a meeting and you want to sort of come across as strong and sort of confident and, and you will sort of, I don't know, maybe do th something like this, like you would be like, oh, I can do it, I can do it. And then you enter the meeting and, uh, and sh her research showed that um, uh, 
how you're perceived in that meeting, if you did sort of that little dance, uh, that uh, you're suddenly perceived as being way more authoritative. Um, it's not actually true. They've tried to repeat this, uh, ex the experiments that she did afterwards. They could never find any kind of similar effect. Um, third one is, uh, and this is the weirdest one, and so all of this research has been published in sort of respectable scientific journals, right? Uh, Travis Carter, the mind-altering effects of the American flag. What they did is they showed one group uh, an image of an American flag, and then they asked them some questions about their political preferences, but also like, should we allow more immigration, less immigration? And then the second group, they didn't, um, they didn't show the American flag. And they showed that it had, uh, and, and so Travis Carter showed that this had a significant effect on people's political preferences, just showing them, the, of course, the political preferences of Americans, right? Um, that this had a significant effect on how they would answer those questions afterward. But not only that, six months later, they got the same people to come back to his uh, research lab, and then they asked them those political questions again. And according to Travis, the, eff the effect persisted. So you show someone the American flag, and six months later, they will be more Republican in their political preferences. This got published in a very prestigious uh, political science journal. Of course, nobody has ever been able to replicate this study afterwards, and believe me, people have tried. Um, this is known as priming research, and a lot of those priming uh, uh, studies have, have failed to replicate. And by fail to replicate, I mean people have tried to do them again. They, they just could not get the same effect. This is all just random error. It's statistical flukes. Um, and the file drawer problem causes it because you don't see all of the failed attempts. And so this evidence looks way more convincing than it really is. Um, the kind of questions you could ask, and this is both of your own research, you know, if you're a journalist and you do research, you're a, a, a data journalist or a regular journalist or any kind of journalist, you might want to ask these questions of your own work, but you can also definitely ask these questions of scientific research if you're a science journalist or uh, you report on science. First is, we didn't really talk about this, but what is the margin of error? Um, because the margin of error is, as a tool is meant to sort of say like, you know, what if things were a little bit different? How would this affect the result? And so could it have been a statistical fluke? So always ask for the margin of error. Uh, often people will talk about significant effect, about statistically significant effects, but how big are those effects? Because if something is statistically significant, that doesn't mean it's gonna be practically significant. So that's always an interesting question to ask. Is the study very small or very large? If it's very small, there will be more random error. If it's very large, and this is kind of a technical thing, so I can't really go into it, but if a study is very, very large, every effect is gonna be statistically significant. This is kind of just how it works, and it's a a flaw in, uh, in a lot of statistical procedures. So if a very large study finds something that you think is not credible, then it probably is not credible. Um, and you should look into that in, in, in more depth. Statistics be damned, is the conclusion at all plausible? Do you think extrasensory perception and mind reading is plausible? I don't, so like the uh, Daryl Bem research, I didn't think it was very plausible anyway, even though it had a, statistical, uh, uh, a statistically significant result. I don't care, it's not plausible, I don't believe it. Might there have been a fishing expedition? So a fishing expedition is the idea that you keep trying, right? Like you don't find what you want, all right, but you just keep fishing until you catch that fish. Um, so we've sort of already talked about that. Are the numbers cherry-picked? So those are some of the questions you might ask to avoid random error in your own work or to spot it in other people's work. Uh, confounding. Confounding is an interesting one. Oh. Um, one interesting case is um, 
admissions uh, bias at Berkeley. What they found was that in graduate school uh, in Berkeley, uh, that women were, had less of a chance of being admitted to, to graduate school than men. I think I might have the numbers actually. Yeah, so in 1973, of all men, 44% uh, were admitted to graduate school in Berkeley. Only 35% of women were admitted. That's kind of damning, right? That is an indication of, uh, of discrimination, potentially. Um, but there's confounding at play. It'd be interesting, so I know it might be a little bit too small for the people in the back, but for those of you who can read it, it'd be interesting to take half a minute to look at this more detailed table and see if you can see anything that looks weird to you. So the departments have been anonymized, but what you can see is that in almost every department, the uh, uh, women, which are the, the second category here, in almost every department, they're admitted more. So it's 60% versus 80%, 63 versus 68. Uh, in Department C, women do have a 3% less of a chance of being admitted to Department C. So that's sort of one of, of, of the uh, uh, counter examples. But so in almost every department, actually women have a larger, a better chance of getting admitted than men. So what is going on? Well, it turned out that after sort of a lot of research that women just tend to apply to different departments. And this was, you know, this was in the 70s. So it's sort of like in, in, in the engineering department and in the chemistry department you wouldn't have many women applicants. And um, it also turned out that those departments were the least selective. A lot of women, on the other hand, applied to the English department, and the English department was very selective. And so just sort of that difference into the kind of stuff that, the kind of majors that they wanted to apply to, that kind of causes that, that difference. So there was not, in the end it turned out that there was no gender bias, that there was no discrimination at play, but it was just sort of people applying to different departments. And this is an example of confounding, and in this case, the department is the confounder. The department confounds the association between potential discrimination and admissions rates. This is kind of how it looks like, I don't know how useful this is for you, but so like you think that X causes Y, but actually what's happening is that C is causing both X and Y. So in this case, it's the preference for one uh, type of department or for another type of major or department that is uh, uh, causing this effect. Now the trouble with randomization is if you know what might be wrong, then you can, uh, then you can do something about it. So for example, if we know that department, uh, that that's sort of problematic, then we add that variable in and we split up that table like we did, and then we look at all of the individual associations in that table, and that way we can get rid of the confounding. And sometimes this works very well. So for example, in epidemiological research, uh, often uh, you will sort of adjust for a confounder. And so adjusting for a confounder, if you hear that in scientific research, what that means, because you hear it a lot, adjusting for a confounder means splitting out that table, essentially. And you can split out that table up to 10 or 20 dimensions if you want. Um, and so if you know what might be up, you can do something about it. And so in a lot of epidemiological research, for example, they will adjust for age, they will adjust for socioeconomic status, they will adjust for previous risk factors, they will adjust for all of those things, and that solves the confounding problem. But the thing is, there might always be confounders that you didn't think of. So we came to the conclusion just before that there wasn't really a discrimination problem here in the Berkeley uh, admissions case from 73. But actually, there might be a third variable, a variable that we haven't even taken into account, 
And if you add that one and you look into that subtable, it might turn out that there is discrimination after all. You just can't know. There might always be another variable. And so that's kind of the scary thing. There might always be an unmeasured confounder. Luckily, there is one particular way that we have found to get rid of any kind of confounding whatsoever, and it's randomization. Because the thing with confounding is what you know is that you have two groups or you have multiple groups and they're not comparable. In the Berkeley admissions case, men and, and women were not comparable because they applied to different departments to a different degree. They're not comparable. And you want to compare apples to apples. Adjusting for a confounder enables you to compare apples to apples. Uh, with randomization, what it does is it puts people randomly into groups. And so because of that, you will never have confounders because people from various different backgrounds will be equally split across both groups because you decided the group that they get to belong to. They didn't decide it themselves. Of course, you can't always randomize. Like, you can't randomly assign people to a department. If someone wants to study English, you can't randomly assign them to the chemistry department. But randomization has been sort of really fruitful, uh, especially in medicine, where they, uh, in a clinical trial, one, people, one person will get a placebo, the other person will get the real treatment. And this gets rid of a lot of uh, confounding. Uh, some, some funny examples of confounding, just sort of to drive the message home, would be uh, stained teeth cause lung cancer. Is that true, do you think? No, it's not true, but what happens if, if, you, if you smoke, you're more like, your teeth are likely to stain a little bit, and if you smoke, you're also more likely to get lung cancer. So uh, stained teeth is a confounder in this case. Uh, there's no risk in being a firefighter. What I mean by that is that firefighters are usually sort of uh, physically very fit p people, and so if you look at the statistics that show, like, are firefighters more likely to die prematurely, you know, from occupational hazards, the statistics might show that, no, actually, they're getting older. They're older, than the gen they, they're older before they die uh, uh, than the general population. What is happening? Well, firefighters are just, in general, more physically fit, and so they live longer, uh, which kind of counteracts the fact that they, uh, uh, they have a, a dangerous occupation. Another example of a confounder. Poor people are stupid is the kind of thing that some people would say. But of course, you know that the confounder here is that they come from uh, a socioeconomic background that makes it harder for them to succeed. So it's that socioeconomic situation that is causing them to perform more poorly on things like standardized tests. And it has nothing to do with sort of intrinsic characteristics of, uh, of poor people, of course. Um, Questions you might, might want to ask of either your own research as a journalist of, or of uh, uh, scientific research, are there alternative explanations? If someone says, does X cause uh, Y, might there be something else going on? And this is just sort of try to be original. Try to come up with as many possible uh, alternative explanations as you can. Can you think of a common cause of the treatment and the outcome? Something that might explain why one caused the other rather than, than sort of the treatment causing the outcome. When comparing two groups of people according to one criterion, are those groups equal on all other counts? So are we comparing apples to apples? What about age, wealth, and time? Because those are almost always confounders, right? Was the study observational, so did we just look at some existing data, or was it actually an experiment where people were randomly assigned to one group, which avoids um, um, confounding? Selection bias is the third main type of error. And it, um, it can be a strange one. It can lead to sort of all sorts of weird um, effects. Usually it's what people think of when we think of non-representative samples. Um, so for example, what might happen if, if you have um, a medical expert, 
and you go to a medical expert, why would you go to a medical expert? Well, maybe you've passed by your general practitioner, your doctor, you asked for uh, something to help against whatever is ailing you. And then if that doesn't help, if the medicine, if the drug that was uh, prescribed to you, if that doesn't help, then you might visit an expert. Because of that, a lot of uh, medical experts believe that general practitioners are idiots because they can never seem to cure anyone because every individual person who comes to the expert comes to the expert because the doctor couldn't sort of figure out a solution. So either the drugs that the doctor subscribes um, are bad or the GPs themselves are bad. This is known as clinician's bias and it's an example of selection bias. The experts only see the bad cases. They don't see all of the cases where uh, the doctor did a very good job at, at fixing people's problems. Um, this is kind of what it looks like sort of causally. The double uh, circle means that you're controlling on Z. Again, you probably have to be a statistician to understand uh, how that works. One very important thing to think about is that randomization avoids confounding. That's what we've seen. That's why clinical trials are so interesting. But representative sampling avoids selection bias. And so those are two very different things. And something you see, for example, again in psychology, I use a lot of examples from psychology. I know, you know, they try their best, but they make so many stupid mistakes sometimes. Um, is that one phenomenon is known as weird studies. And weird stands for let me think, Western, educated, industrialized, uh, rich, and democratic. And so it's the idea that a lot of psychological studies are actually randomized, they're experiments, so they avoid all possible confoundings, but by doing all of the research, uh, by these, psycholo these psychologists, they do most of their research on uh, undergraduates, you know, because those are the easiest study subjects to get, they just ask, um, their students like, hey, you have to participate in my experiment. And so 90% of what we know of modern psychology is actually not the psychology of men or the psychology of, of, of people. It's, no, it's the psychology of mostly American undergraduates. Uh, and so that's a big example of, of selection bias, which is present even, even though they randomize. The selection bias is, uh, leads to all sorts of really weird phenomena. One in particular that is, is sort of a real sort of brain twister, even for me, is a piece of research came out a couple of years ago and it showed that if your parents are more supportive of you, if they give you all the money you need to go to college, then you're more likely to have bad grades huh, that's weird. Why would supportive parents lead to worse grades? Now, the researchers came up with this really convoluted story, like, well, you know, if, uh, if your parents support you in everything, then you probably don't have as much of a go-getter attitude. It's like everything is being handed to you on a plate, so like you don't study well because you're like, yeah, my parents will just help me with any sort of, you know, they'll help me get a job, whatever. Actually, none of this is true. What ended up happening, and, and the reason why this research has then later been invalidated, is that, think about it, how did they measure this? They went to university, and at that university, they investigated, like, all right, do parents support their kid, who is a student here? And how does that affect their grade point average? How does that affect their, their scores? What you might imagine might happen is what would cause you to drop out of school? I can think of two main reasons. You would drop out of school because your grades are really bad. Or you might drop out of school because you just don't have the money to afford it. And what if you don't have the money to afford it really, or barely have the money to afford it, and your grades are bad, well, then you're definitely going to drop out. It's like, I'm not going to be able to finish this. I don't have the money, and my grades suck, so I, I should quit. Uh, 
the result is that if you have parents who support you in college, you will sort of stick it out. You will say like, well, my grades are bad, but you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try just a little bit longer. I'm gonna hold on. If you don't have that money and your grades are bad, you're gonna drop out. If you then measure only the people who are still at the university, what you are measuring is a lot of rich, mediocre students because they haven't dropped out yet, but you won't measure all of the mediocre, poor students because they'll have dropped out. They're, and so they're invisible to the, research, to the research. And the result is that, as, uh, you know, as this piece of research found, is that if you have more money, then your grades are likely to be lower. But this is just because all of the sort of poorer people who had bad grades are invisible. They aren't counted. It's a kind of a very counterintuitive in a way. Like, but once you know the mechanism behind it, it's like, oh yeah, this is like a typical example of a non-representative sample, right? Um, but it's very counterintuitive and those effects, uh, it's, it's selection bias, but this specific kind of almost inversal is called Bergson's bias, just a, a, a specific name for that. The kind of questions you might wanna ask about selection bias to make sure that it's not present in your own work or not present in scientific work that you are reading up about. Is the data a representative sample of the population? What are the selection criteria for admission to the population? Are people with poor outcomes or good outcomes consistently measured or do they become invisible? It's just trying to figure out, is this sample representative? Uh, measurement error is the next to last uh, kind of error we'll talk about. You might think like, why even measure, uh, why even mention measurement error? Because from a statistical point of view, me measurement error, and this is just a technical detail, it always reduces down to confounding or selection bias. It either causes confounding or selection bias. So why treat it separately here? Uh, and we know that everything is imperfectly measured, so why, you know, is, it, is this useful to put so much attention into? Well, actually, yeah, because this is the cause of so many medical misunderstandings in the past 20 or 30 years. Um, yeah, you, you, you're probably familiar with this kind of research, right? Like you should drink a glass of wine a day and this will be good for you. I think most people, right, have heard this or maybe their doctors have even told them or maybe you've even written a story about this. Um, it's not true. What happens is that um, this is actually, yeah, this is an interesting one. You should kind of think about this for yourself for a little bit. What would, um, so what they find is, what the research reports is, um, you know, if you drink that one glass of wine a day, you are gonna be in better health, and especially heart health, I think. It's about cardiac uh, health. Um, you're gonna be in better health than people who drink no alcohol at all. Who drinks no alcohol at all? Why would you not drink any alcohol? Why, I mean, there's many reasons, but can you think of some? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for example, you used to be an alcoholic, so now you abstain from alcohol. Think of any other reasons? Exactly, and your doctor tells you, like, you have a health problem, and if you're gonna drink alcohol with this, it's just gonna get worse. You have medication, and if you use it together with alcohol, the medication won't work. So people who drink no alcohol are generally very unhealthy people, not because they don't drink any alcohol, but just because, you know, because of various health reasons. And you would think people would understand this kind of thing, right? You would think that an epidemiologist or, or, or the doctors or people doing research into this, that they would take this into account. Well, actually, they did a meta-analysis of 30, 40 different research papers that investigate uh, this phenomenon, the, the healing effects of moderate alcohol consumption, and they found that the large majority of them did not take this into account, did not take into account that people who don't drink any alcohol usually don't do it 
or in many cases don't do it out of choice, but do it because they have other pre -con uh, existing conditions. Once you take that into account, actually the, the effect of moderate alcohol consumption on your health practically disappears. I think what the, the latest research shows is that some doctors still think that it might have a teeny tiny effect, but, uh, but everything that's been reported in, uh, uh, in newspapers is wrong. And so the interesting thing about this, it's measurement error, right? Like you can measure, you can know of all of your confounders. You can know of anything that might cause selection bias, but if you don't properly measure something, if you don't properly measure things, then your conclusions could still be wrong. Uh, regression to the mean is another kind of um, measurement error. It's where people only measure the very best or the very worst. And what ends up happening is that always if someone is at the very top of their game, if you think of like, all right, let's uh, think about uh, uh, Tim Cook, CEO of, of Apple. Why is he CEO of Apple? Probably because he's very good at what he does, but also probably because of luck. You know, luck and at various parts in his life and luck that uh, Steve Jobs died, I guess, you know, so the position was available. And his intrinsic qualities, those are going to stay pretty constant over time, but his luck might run out. And so if you only look at the top performers, over time they will always do worse because their luck will run out. If you only look at the very worst performers, their bad luck will run out and they will always do better over time. Uh, one interesting example, and it's another one I got from uh, Daniel Kahneman from his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. He tells the story of how an instructor at a flight academy uh, says, you know, the best way to really help flight cadets get, you know, to really get the best performance out of them to make, their, to make them the best possible pilots is when they do badly, shout at them, and when they do good, uh, shout at them too, because it's like, you know, then, you know, maybe they, they get a little bit of praise, but, but if you praise them too much, no, they're gonna, uh, you know, they're go gonna become uh, pampered and, and they won't do their best. And uh, the flight instructor told Kahneman, and if I do this, my students always do better. So if they do worse, I, I, I uh, shout at them and then they do better. But if they do very well, and then I say like, oh man, you did a really good job, then the next time they do worse. But this is just a statistical effect. It is just a regression to the mean. It has nothing to do at all with the educational intervention of the instructor. Um, this is especially a problem, I think, in business reporting, but also in, in sort of while well, business administration in general, it's like you will have these books that, for example, they look at the top five companies in a certain uh, uh, industry, and, uh, and then they will follow those companies and they will come up with all sorts of conclusions about what makes these five companies great, and then later it turns out that those companies um, all go bankrupt. That sort of thing happens embarrassingly often for um, uh, professors who study businesses and it's because they only studied the top or only studied the bottom. Um, what can we do about measurement error or how can we spot it? Well, some questions we might ask of our own research or other research is how is everything measured? Was the data self-reported? Because self-reported data is often sort of wonky. You know, you don't always um, know whether what you're measuring is, is terribly accurate. When adjusting for a confounder, does the way the confounder is measured capture the full extent of the phenomenon? Another example of this would be sort of the idea that red meat is bad for you. Last you know, evidence we have, yes, consuming red meat every day is kind of bad for you. But people who eat red meat have all kinds of other, uh, that frequently have other sort of bad habits that you know, um, also cause a lot of uh, a lot of those problems, so it's very similar to the, the alcohol example. What is the proposed causal pathway? Are there any alternatives? So sort of the same question you ask about confounding, right? 
was the research limited to the best or the worst cases? And then, you know, now we're almost through. Judgment error is the last one. Um, and we don't really need to sort of say too much about this. It's just when you, um, when, you th when you answer a question correctly, but the question you answer is not the right question. And so, for example, if you look at immigration and crime, something that you see in the crime stats again and again and again, and this is irrefutable, is that actually, yeah, migrants do, as a rule, um, commit more crimes, unfortunately. But the question is, like, is, is this the right question to ask? Is that the question we should be asking? Because another question you could ask is, like, well, if we control for socioeconomic status, if we compare people of the same socioeconomic status, do they then still commit more crimes? And then the answer is no. No, if you control for sort of the environment that they're in, for the limited funds that are available to them, et cetera, et cetera. If you control for all of those factors, then suddenly immigrants don't commit more crimes. So both of those are correct. You can say immigrants commit more crimes, and you can say, no, immigrants don't commit more crimes, and both of you are correct. So it's just a matter of, like, what question are you really trying to answer? And so that's a question of judgment, really. And this is often a problem in... Um, in scientific research as well, where there's always, there's often a difference between what is known as the statistical hypothesis and the research hypothesis. And I'm just gonna reuse an example that I used yesterday, so sorry for those of you who were here then, I'm just gonna repeat it. Let's say a piece of uh, psychological research finds that if you solve a Sudoku every day, you get smarter. So that's the PR message they put out, right? They, they say, Solve a Sudoku every day and you will become a smarter person. All right, so that's the PR message, but then let's sort of step back and look at the actual research that was performed. Usually the way this goes is they let a bunch of people solve a Sudoku, and then afterwards they look at whether those people are better or worse at remembering sort of 10, 10 random numbers. All right. Why are they asking them whether they can remember 10 random numbers? Well, because that's an indication of how good their working memory is, you know. But already, that's sort of like, hmm, is it really a good, I, and I, um, is it really a good measurement of how good their working memory is? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe not. That's a judgment they make. Then they make the further judgment that if your working memory is better, that might mean that you do better in a variety of tasks. That might mean that you are more intelligent, as it were. But that's another judgment call, right? Like, is working memory really related to intelligence or is it not? They might probably, then if this gets into a news article, the reporter might say, well, all right, so we found that uh, playing Sudokus makes you more intelligent, so you should play, you should solve a Sudoku every day. That might be the recommendation. But this is another judgment call, because even if you accept that it actually supposedly makes you smarter, because it increases your working memory, well, so does learning a foreign language. So why should you be solving Sudokus when you can just learn Italian? You know, that might be a way more fun way to, to sort of spend your time and become smarter that way. And so all of those judgment calls kind of disappear in all of the PR messages that are sort of um, uh, put out about scientific research, the difference between the research that was actually performed and what they want you to believe it actually says, there's usually a huge gap between that. And, and that's what uh, some statisticians mockingly refer to as story time. It's, you know, you have your research and then it's like you weave a story around it to make it sort of, to make it nicer. Um, questions you might ask to spot judgment error, what claims are being made and what was actually tested. Try to really see what is the difference between those. And a good way to do that is, is the traditional five whys. So it's sort of like, you know, someone says like, okay, Sudokus make you smarter. And it's like, why? Well, because we found that, you know, it, uh, it increases your working memory and working memory is related to intelligence. Why is it related to intelligence? And it's like, oh, but, well, but you know, your working memory. And it's like, yeah, but, what, what is the relationship between testing how good someone is at remembering 10 random numbers and your working memory? 
why is that related? So you just keep asking why until you're satisfied with, with sort of the responses. Um, if we expect long-term effects, would the data be able to show those? Didn't really talk about that, but I guess we're kind of running out of time. Um, to recap, you have five types of error, five types of error that stand in between a correlation and a cause that might make a correlation not a cause. First is random error, just statistical flukes. Second is confounding, where there's a third factor that is influencing what you think is a relationship between two things. Third one is selection bias, which is when your sample is not representative and similar problems to that. Measurement error is when you measure things imperfectly, and almost everything that is measured in science and in society is measured imperfectly. So this is a really, really important one. Always ask, like, is what is being measured an accurate sort of uh, stand-in for what we are really trying to know? Judgment error, there's often a tendency and I see this among data journalists as well, is you have certain data and you can prove certain things with that data, but it's not exactly what you wanted, but you sort of weave a story around it and then it's like, well, this data obviously shows that, and then you start spouting bullshit. So judgment error is, is, is a, a, a big one to keep into account. Um, so that takes us through all the errors, I guess, just as a quick recap, I want to put this into context in, into context in the context of a clinical trial. Because clinical trials are really, in many ways, the gold standard for scientific research. And your question might be, why are they? Um, and they are for a couple of reasons. For starters, clinical trials are always randomized. You're randomly assigned to the treatment condition or to another group where no treatment is being given, usually a placebo is being given. So they're randomized and that helps against confounding. Um, another thing is that clinical trials usually have a protocol. It is decided beforehand what kind of statistical tests they will do, exactly what they will test, so that protects against fishing expeditions. It also protects against many judgment errors because you've said beforehand, like, you know, if we see this, we're going to conclude this. If we see this, we're going to conclude this. And by doing all of that beforehand really helps. Um, selection bias, well, there's not really anything special that a clinical trial does to help against selection bias. Um, but, uh, and, and actually this might be one of the main problems because uh, because of something that is known as differential dropout. If people who take the drug get nauseous, get ill, they might drop out of the study, whereas the people who got the placebo, well, they don't care. They're not getting any better, but they're not getting any worse. So they might stay in the study, and that might make the treatment actually look better than it is. But still, a lot of effort is put into avoiding these kinds of, uh, um, these kinds of dropout phenomena. Measurement error is solved through blinding. Blinding of the person who receives the treatment. They, know, they don't know if they get a placebo or if they get the treatment. Blinding of the doctors, because the doc, a doctor could say like, oh yeah, yeah, these people on the treatment, they're really improving, but that might just be wishful thinking. But often the doctor are, is blinded to whether a certain person is getting the treatment or is getting the placebo. So they don't know, so no measurement error is introduced there. Often even the analysts, often even the statisticians are blind to whether condition A or B is the treatment or the placebo. So even the analysts can't introduce any biases, can't introduce any measurement error. And judgment error is, is again, is prevented because of a protocol which sort of, uh, uh, Beforehand, everything is discussed in detail, like what are we going to conclude depending on what we see. Um, of course, in many cases, it's impossible to do a randomized clinical trial. Um, a lot of the stuff that, that we as journalists uh, are involved with, it's you have data from society, right? You have data from the economy. Is the economy going better or worse? And it's like you can't do an experiment on the economy. Well, there is such a thing as a natural experiment, but it's, um, it's very rare. Um, 
But I, I just wanted to mention it because it gives you an idea of sort of what the gold standard is for scientific evidence. Um, and to give you an idea of all, how all of these different things fit together. But uh, yeah, that was the end of my talk. And, and so I hope you've learned something. Thanks. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, yeah, I have um, one question about your last thing. There is actually a campaign starting today. It's called uh, Treat Me Like a Lady for um, because in these gold standard clinical trials, mm -hmm. women are really, really underrepresented because we are um, fertile women. So all women between 16 and 55 basically are excluded um, because they don't usually know what will do to your fertility and they don't want to get sued. Meaning that they have very little clue about a lot of medicines and how it works actually on a female body. So the, there, there is exactly this uh, representation and sample bias actually and uh, so the population and right. sample, um, they, it turns out now that right. it completely is wrong. Another question I want to ask, more an explanatory question. I've worked with statistical data, I've done social science, um, mm -hmm. but the p-value has always rather remained rather mystical to me. Mm -hmm. I know it must be below 0 0.05. Right. What that actually means? Could <laughs> you maybe give some more explanation? Because I know I have to watch out for it, but what does it mean? Sure. And so the other one uh, also relates to that. Do you have a rule of thumb for the how big the end should be? Because I know it mm -hmm. must be over 90, but I've never heard of the really big number. Um, what's the top and what's the bottom? Sure. Okay, I'll answer in reverse, I guess. Uh, when it comes to sample sizes, there are good calculators for it because it really depends on how large you expect the effect size to be. If the effect is very large, you might only need five people to figure it out. It's sort of like the, uh, uh, once a, a parody appeared, it was uh, the life-saving effect of parachutes. And it, it was sort of, we compared one group of people with parachutes to one group of people without parachutes. All of the people with parachutes survived, none of the people without parachutes survived. You only need really one, pers one person without a parachute to know that, right? Uh, so uh, the sample size you need depends on the effect size, um, which is very extreme in, in, in that case. Um, P-values. P-values are interesting. My advice to everyone here, because uh, if you're a science journalist, you, you probably read through quite a lot of P-values. Ignore them. Just ignore them. They, they suck. Um, what you really want to know is the effect size. And if you want to know the effect size, just look at the margins of error. Because actually, a p-value and, and a margin of error around an effect size, so you could say like, all right, we tested a, a, a medicine against, uh, against a headache, and we found that it reduced the severity of the headache between 10 and 30% on average, for example. Because that's your sort of margin of error, that's your confidence interval, which is uh, what it's called. This is actually strictly superior to a p-value, because you can infer your p-value from it. If you have if your decision rule is that your p-value needs to be below 0.05%, uh, that would be equivalent to a confidence interval. In that case, that would go over zero. So if, for example, if the result of that drug against a headache would be that the effect of the drug is between minus 5%, so your headache would actually be getting more severe, to 30%, it overlaps with zero, and because of that, it would be a stat, stat, uh, statistically non-significant effect. So you can get all the information you want out of your confidence intervals, and there's never, 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 never any reason to look at a p-value. That said, for those of you who are interested in p-values, the, the actual, like what bothers me about them so much is that they are almost begging to be misinterpreted. A p-value is the definition of it is, what if nothing were going on? What if sort of you have, say, you know, let's continue with the example of the drug against headaches. What if the drug absolutely does not help against headaches? We assume this, right? This is our starting position. How often would we then see the results that we saw 
in our research. Because, you know, even though the drug might not help, five people or ten people might still report like, oh yeah, this drug, it, for me, it worked wonders. And this might happen just due to chance, right? And so what a p-value is, is consider that everything is due to chance. What is the probability of seeing the results that we saw, or more extreme results, like even better results, due to chance? And so the lower it is, the better, of course, because if nothing is going on, and your, P, uh, and, uh, and your chances of seeing those kinds of results solely due to chance are very low, if the chances of, of, of that being due to chance are very low, then of course the chances of it being due to the actual treatment are very high, you know, by complement. So this is why a p-value has to be low. But the problem with this is that a p-value answers the wrong question. You don't want to know whether, given that the treatment does not work, how likely are we to see this? No, you want to know, like, what, how probable is it that the treatment actually worked? But this is a different question. Um, and, uh, and this sort of gets into sort of Bayesian statistics, which we can't really go into here, in, into now. But, so just look at confidence intervals, I guess. And then as to your first point of, uh, of women being excluded of, uh, out of many uh, randomized clinical trials, yeah, absolutely, that's a, a, a big problem. I agree. Any other questions? Nope. All right, then thank you for your time. <laughs>